Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London and I'm delighted to be joined today by Timothy Versteinen. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology and the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition at Carnegie Mellon University. And he, along with Bradley Wojtek, have uh, written a fascinating book entitled Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sleep? Uh, a neuro sorry, Undead Sheep, a neuroscientific view of the zombie brain. And he's co-authored this book with Bradley Wojtek, who is an assistant professor of computational cognitive science and neuroscience at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, they are both members of the Zombie Research Society and are preparing grant applications to research the coming zombie apocalypse. So basically, this is a, a fun book, which also talks a lot of serious neuroscience, but uses zombies as a way of explaining how the brain works. So let me start by asking you, Timothy, why did you use zombies as a way of trying to explain how the brain works? Well, I, I mean, why not? It's uh, Zombies are, are, are a fun... Uh, interesting topic. They're very popular at the moment. Um, they also have a very devout subcultural following. So for a person who's interested in science outreach like myself and, and like my co-author Brad, the, the fact that they're already engaged in a topic makes it very easy to kind of leverage that interest and pull them towards scientific information. So uh, Brad and I are both zombie geeks. We, we used to uh, watch zombie movies together when we were in graduate school together. And so uh, we thought that one of the ways that science outreach has had um, some success in the past is when you kind of engage people's natural interests. So instead of trying to bring external non-science people to science, why not bring science to them? And so uh, zombies, from a neuroscientific perspective, are a very useful tool because essentially they're a very complicated neurological patient. They show lots of behavioral disorders and there are so many different types of zombies in different zombie movies that you can find examples of different behavioral symptoms and link them back up to the brain very easily. So it's kind of a a general person, a general purpose patient that we can diagnose. So in the book, Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? Um, could you just kind of explain the plan of the book? Because you kind of go through each chapter looking at a specific zombie symptom and looking at a particular part of the brain that might explain that symptom. So, yeah, so we set out to do a kind of classic neurological investigation. And um, we, we kind of start the book by talking about the history of, of uh, zombies in the brain and then uh, head, basically uh, dive in head first, if you will, um, by treating zombies like a neurological patient. So we isolate specific symptoms and approach explaining each one of those symptoms uh, in a systematic way. So uh, in the beginning of the book, we kind of outline, outline things like how they move, how they talk, how they make spatial decisions, uh, and then go through chapter by chapter and use that as an opportunity to teach principles on the neural control of movement or neural control of language. And uh, along the way, also teach a little bit of history of neuroscience regarding you know, how people discovered these symptoms or systems, if you will. So uh, the approach was to really try to be very systematic. And actually, when Brad and I started, what we wanted to do is say that we're going we're gonna to tell a science book and have everything be real except the target organism we're discussing. So um, we're really just trying to trick people into uh, reading about uh, these different neural systems. Ah, but in fact, one of the early points you make at the beginning of the book is that zombies might be more real than people realize. And you explain that in the Caribbean country of Haiti, uh, the religious practice of voodoo seems to be linked to the actual creation of zombies. And you mention some neuropharmacology in the form of a substance called tetrotoxin, uh, tetrodotoxin and datura. Can you explain a little bit about how the practitioners of voodoo seem to be able to create zombies using these chemicals, tetrodotoxin and datura? Yeah, so this is still somewhat of a controversial finding. The uh, story behind the neuropharmacology of Haitian zombies uh, is found in a great book by Wade Davis 
uh, called The Serpent and the Rainbow, and it came out in the 1980s. And um, it's a first-person account of Dr. Davis, who is an uh, ethnobotanist, um, when he traveled to Haiti and tried to kind of uh, get at these random stories that he was hearing about uh, Haitian zombies, about people who uh, were uh, dead and then brought back to life. And so in, in his book and in his description of his research, he uh, went down to Haiti and um, spent a lot of time investing himself into the history and the um, religious beliefs behind Haitian zombieism. And I should point out that Haitian zombies are dramatically different than horror movie zombies in many ways. It's actually a uh, uh, kind of a socially accepted form of slavery. Um, so what would happen is, is that if your village had a problematic individual, they would hire a uh, bokor or a, a voodoo priest to basically poison it individual to look like they had died. And then if the person uh, wakes back up after the poison wears off, the before will, will basically take possession of the individual and sell them off as a slave on the other part of the island. Um, so it's actually a very kind of horrific practice. Um, but along the way, Wade Davis found that in part of the potion that the before used to simulate death, uh, they use ground up puffer fish and puffer fish, their sex organs have a large quantity of a neurotoxin known as tetrodotoxin and tetrodotoxin blocks the sodium channels in neurons in the brain. Basically it makes neurons unable to fire um, and it works primarily in the peripheral nervous system in the body. So what happens is you get this whole body paralysis, your breathing becomes shallow and it looks like you're dead. And in fact, if you get, a full lethal dose of tetrodotoxin, you die because you stop breathing. The muscle and your, your diaphragm stops moving. Um, and so what we Davis found is that if, you, if you're poisoned just enough to look like you're dead, when the tetrodotoxin wears off, the uh, bokor will dig you up because it lasts long enough for you to be buried in Haiti. And then he uses a, uh, a plant known as dartura, um, which is a uh, plant that contains many psychotropic substances. Um, uh, scopolamine is one of them, and it's a natural hallucinogen, and basically it makes the person pliable, so they're in this kind of dazed psychotic state, um, and so those two neural chemicals uh, are, are intimately linked to the pharmacology of Haitian zombieism, so as a teaching tool for cellular channels and psychotropic substances, it was a perfect anecdote about how even the Haitian zombies, the early zombies, have this tight link up to the brain. Now, let's go on to look at some of the symptoms that zombies display. And one of them is they don't seem to be really awake, and they also don't seem to be fully asleep. They're in this kind of twilight state of consciousness. And you use this to explain what we understand about how the brain goes about manufacturing sleep. Could you say a little bit about, about that? Sure. Uh, the brain has these on and off switches buried uh, deep in the brain or near the brain stem and the midbrain. So uh, kind of the evolutionarily older parts of the brain. And uh, what these systems do is they kind of function as a pure on off switch. So you activate your arousal system and it stimulates uh, these ascending pathways that go up from the brain stem into the cortex and basically turn on the cortex. They arouse you and they, they wake you up. Um, and just next to that system is another system that basically does the reverse. It shuts off your cortical circuits so that you can turn into a, go into a sleep state. Um, and we really don't know why we need sleep yet. There's some theories related to memory consolidation, um, and kind of homeostasis, but really the uh, goal of that chapter was to teach these brain systems. And um, so when we looked at the kind of on off switches of the brain, they're in areas that are also linked up to other kind of symptoms that we diagnose in the zombie. So it was a very easy symptom to kind of bring back into focus and teach. Um, and so we say that, that zombies kind of are in this perpetual state of not turning off the off, not turning on the off switch. So um, they're almost in a chronic sleepwalking state. They don't have the paralysis that they that you have when you're in a sleep state, but they don't have the full consciousness you have when you're in a conscious state. 
And so we say they're basically in walking in this never-ending sleep state. And one of the interesting points that comes out from the book is this idea that evolutionarily it makes sense that when we wake up, we wake up kind of fast and become fully awake. And if we fall asleep, we shut down kind of fast and become fully asleep. But it didn't make evolutionary sense to be kind of lumbering around just like zombies do in a kind of twilight state because you could easily become a victim for predators that way. So that was quite an interesting idea that even I as a psychiatrist wasn't aware of before. The notion that actually whatever the system is, it has to work really really fast to wake you up fast and make you go to sleep fast. Right, right. And it, I mean, it makes sense why it needs to be fast, right? Like if you if you go back to, you know, human history before we had houses and safe walls, you know, if you're asleep near a fire in the woods uh, you, and a predator is kind of lurking near, you're going to be sensitive to things that, you know, sensory events in the environment, uh, sound of a twig snapping, that kind of thing. And when it tells you that you need to wake up, you want to be able to wake up and get away fast. Um, so evolutionarily, these this, the speed of these switches is is advantageous, but sometimes the speed of the switches can work against you. So in syndromes like narcolepsy, for example, the fast off switch kind of triggers automatically. Um, and for reasons we don't quite know yet, you can get this transition from fully awake to fully asleep almost instantaneously. And so um, in that case, you know, narcolepsy evolutionarily is not a good thing. You don't want to be running around the savannah and then just suddenly fall asleep. Um, but uh, it's an, it, it is interesting how this, this, this speed of these transitions works in our favor most of the time. And the other interesting point was that a lot of sleep disorders can perhaps be explained, um, according to what you're writing, by problems in this transition state. So maybe sleepwalking, for example, can be explained by problems in the transition between being awake and being asleep. Yes, that's a very popular theory right now for um, the origins of, of sleepwalking, that you, um, you kind of, your brain half engages the on on switch while you're supposed to be fully asleep. And so what happens is that when you're asleep, your brain's not really off. Your brain is doing a lot of things. In fact, there's lots of bursts of neural activity in your cortex while you're sleeping. And one important part about the off switch is that it's, it stops signals from the brain from going out into the body and moving your muscles. Um, and some theories about sleepwalking is that what happens is the part of the off switch doesn't quite work and it forgets to turn off those descending pathways. And as a result, the activity that's going on in your cortex while you're sleeping activates the peripheral body. And so you are engaging in things that you're, you know, somewhat dreaming in. Um, and so this, this on off switch is very, it's one of those cases in, in science where it seems very simple, you know, just an on switch and an off switch. But in fact, it's broadly complicated and can, you know, screw up in many different ways that lead to these fascinating disorders. So moving on to the other interesting, um, one of the other interesting points in this fascinating book about the fact that zombies may be more real than, than realized. There, there's a psychiatric syndrome you describe called Cotard syndrome, described by a French psychiatrist active in the late 1800s um, in Paris. Um, tell us a bit about Cotard syndrome and why there's a sense in which it, it, it almost seems to represent a kind of psychotic delusional state that, that it gets quite close to what it must be like to be a zombie. Yeah, I'm not, I actually, I, I wouldn't think that Cotard's delusion is necessarily what it would feel like to be a zombie. Cotard's delusion is this psychiatric delusion and it's usually comes around with other types of psychiatric illness like schizophrenia. And what it is is that the individual believes that uh, either parts of their body are dead, so um, you know the, or your 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 intestines have rotted away, or that your whole body is dead and that you're somehow still alive. And so patients with this delusion suffer from this high anxiety state that they are either dead or dying. Um, even though you can show them that you know they are perfectly healthy, they're they're not, you know, their guts aren't hanging out and spilling everywhere. Uh, um, you can show that to them, but they still hold on to this, this delusion that they are. Um, and we don't know a lot about the neural origins of this delusion. It's actually fairly rare. Um, and 
we're still trying to get a handle on, on, on why it is that people suffer from this delusion. But it's a fascinating case because it's one of those cases where you, no matter how much evidence you present to the patient that they are in fact alive, um, they still deny it. So um, we kind of uh, tongue in cheek joked around that uh, the movie Warm Bodies, which is a zombie movie that came out a couple of years ago, it's the uh, zombie Romeo and Juliet, um, uh, is a movie, in fact, about a mass case of Cotard's delusion. Because in the movie, I don't want to spoil it, um, but I'm going to spoil it a little bit. One of the things about it is that, you know, as soon as zombies start to fall in love, they start to cure themselves. Um, and so it w looked to be a fascinating case that actually zombies uh, are just a massive case of Cotard's delusion. But it gives us a clue that maybe there's a part of the brain allocated to, to, to identifying different parts of your body, for example. It, it, it gives us an idea that some of the kind of things we take for granted in terms of perception are actually coded for by particular parts of the brain. Right, right. And we, we make the case uh, repeatedly throughout the book that, that a lot of our perceptions of reality and the world around us are just strictly coded as... as complex representations in the brain. Another, another syndrome we talk about, a uh, fascinating kind of uh, psychiatric syndrome when we talk about it is prosopagnosia, which is face blindness. So uh, people with prosopagnosia can look at somebody and uh, they can say that their eyes are in the right place and they're colored blue, that their hair is brown, that their cheeks are round and their, you know, their nose is, is sharp and their jaw is sharp. Um, but they won't be able to tell you who that individual is. And they could be looking at themselves in a mirror and not be able to tell them that that's who they are. Um, and this gives us a fascinating clue as to how the brain represents faces. So it turns out that um, the way that we recognize people from their faces is a form of kind of specialized object perception. So the whole becomes greater than the sum of its parts. And somewhere in the brain is this representation of identity. So it's beyond the face, it's beyond all the features that, that make the visual appearance of you, you, that in the brain there's this high-level concept of identity that somehow gets disrupted in individuals with prosopagnosia. And what about this other syndrome you talk about, alien hand syndrome, which you also use very neatly to explain why the brain crosses over, the fibers cross over from one side to the other, and that may have an evolutionary purpose. Mm -hmm. So uh, alien hand syndrome is fascinating. You typically see it in patients who suffer uh, or who undergo uh, a callosotomy, which is the corpus callosum is a major pathway that connects the left and he right hemispheres together. And in patients who undergo um, elective surgery for intractable epilepsy, they'll uh, undergo surgery where they have this cut so that when you're having a seizure on the right side of your brain, it doesn't spread to the left side of your brain. Um, and what they started noticing after uh, neurosurgeons started doing these callosotomy surgeries was that sometimes patients would report that no matter how hard they tried, their left hand was just acting on its own. That, um, you know, they would uh, take a plate out of the pantry and then with their right hand and the left hand would put it back. Or another patient reported they would button up their shirt with their right hand and then their left hand would start unbuttoning it. And they, they would say that it was acting as if it had a will of its own. Um, and what we now think causes this syndrome is that by disconnecting the left and right hemispheres, what you're doing is you're disconnecting the uh, ability for the language areas that are typically located in the left hemisphere to communicate with the motor control regions in the right hemisphere, which happen to control your left hand. Um, so what's happening is that your two hemispheres are kind of acting independently as two independent brains. And um, a lot of our sense of volition revolves around our ability to talk about what we're doing. And so in patients with alien hand syndrome, they feel volitional on their right hand, which is controlled in the same hemisphere as their language. And so they feel a lot that what their right hand is doing is under their volitional control. But why? While their left hand, which is guided by their right hemisphere, is doing something else, they feel like they don't have volitional control over it. Now, over time, this syndrome wears off. So this is a very often just a very transient syndrome. Uh, but it tells us a lot about the relationship between the sense of volition and motor control.
Um, and it happens to be just linked up to the fact that we have this cross wiring between our motor cortices so that the left motor cortex controls the right side of the body and vice versa for the left. And that may have an evolutionary purpose. It may make sense that when an enemy or a predator attacks you on one side of the body, that the perception of that of that side is is linked to the fact that the side of the body that should contract is on the side that the predator is attacking you from. Sort of, yes. So uh, this is a hypothesis that was put forth by the uh, uh, neuroscientist Ramoni Cajal. Um, and Ramoni Cajal was, uh, came up with this hypothesis almost as just a brainstorm. Um, you're just kind of thinking, about why we would have these cross wirings and he uh, this hypothesis so far as I know is the best hypothesis for why we have this contralateral organization of our limbs and he said that in animals where you have limbs where you kind of you know you need to push off on one side in order to move away from an object you want to have a contralateral organization because our eyes are crossed so this is a really weird phenomenon so in order to have 3D vision, we have our visual world shared between the left and right hemispheres. So our eyeballs um, project the left visual field, things that appear in the left side of your visual space, to the right hemisphere of your optic cortex, and vice versa for things that appear on the right side of your brain. So we have this cross wiring of our visual cortex. So that means if you have a predator coming at you from the right side, the left visual cortex is going to see it first. So you have an evolutionary advantage to allow for those left optic signals to go to the left motor cortex and push off from the right. So there's this quick advantage for the fact that we have these external limbs and these crossed visual pathways to have this contralateral organization. And animals that don't have limbs, like fish, don't actually show this contralateral organization in their, in their muscles. So it really does appear to be linked to visual pathways and the fact that we have limbs. So we're running out of time a little bit, Timothy, and we could talk for much, much longer about this fascinating book. The title of the book, again, is Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? But um, I'm going to ask, my final question is coming up very shortly, and just to warn you, it's going to be why we're so fascinated by zombies, and I'll come back to that in a second. But one final thing, I couldn't really let you go without asking you about Mike the Chicken. Could you tell us the story of Mike the Chicken? <laughs> So Mike the Chicken terrifies me as a neuroscientist. Uh, Mike the Chicken uh, is a famous case in the 1940s. A farmer uh, was, was, was hungry, uh, and as farmers do, they were going to have chicken for that night. So uh, the farmer went out and decided he was going to cut off the head of Mike the Chicken and make him dinner. And uh, what happened was that the farmer missed a little bit, lopped off most of Mike's head, but Mike the Chicken stayed alive. Mike the Chicken, instead of running around and then finally falling down, kept moving around. And in fact, Mike the headless chicken lived for about 18 months without a head. Um, so he went on tour, he was featured in Life magazine, and there was this creature that would eat. Um, he had to be hand fed, of course, but he would eat, he would walk around, he would respond to sensory stimuli. He just didn't have a head. And so uh, Mike the chicken is sometimes used as an argue that we don't really need a brain at all. Um, what really happened was that uh, the farmer missed uh, cutting off Mike's head completely and left intact the lower brainstem parts of Mike's brain. So um, the very primitive parts of the brain that are present in uh, lower vertebrates and invertebrates was still active in Mike the chicken. So he was able to use those lower level brain areas to stay alive, to do some basic survival responses, but he couldn't do very complex things. So uh, Mike the chicken has been around as a, as a myth to scare neuroscientists at night as they go to bed. Um, but it, it really is a fascinating case to show that a lot of very complex things can be done with just your brainstem. So finally, um, why are we so interested in zombies? I mean, I have a personal theory, which is that we live in a society where increasingly, you know, we have to get crushed on the tube or the underground or the metro. We battle with people in cities and we actually feel that other people are a bit like zombies. They seem unfeeling and we don't really <laughs> seem able to, to connect with them. So I think it reflects a, a modern sense that we live in a world surrounded by people who don't seem fully conscious. Um, but that was my own theory. Um, I, I wondered what your theory uh, as to why zombies are so much in vogue at the moment. Well, so if you actually look at the history of the modern horror zombie, the 
the zombies change with time. They're the only horror monster who's kind of who, who the way they act, uh, the way they are, their origins, everything about them seems to change. So now we have fast zombies that are linked to viral infections and, you know, um, can scale walls and work together as swarms. If you've seen the movie World War Z, the original zombies were slow. They didn't work together necessarily. They were, um, you know, stiff and they were arose from space dust or nuclear uh, uh, exposure or toxic waste. And really zombies are a very flexible metaphor for the general things we fear about others. And so, uh, you know, George Romero, when he made Night of the Living Dead, was making a kind of a social statement about uh, capitalism, actually, and the kind of blind watering that people do to kind of go after the current product or go after um, the, uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm still there, yes, yes. yes. Um, to go after the current, uh, you know, Thing in vogue, and so he was trying to make a social statement about capitalism. But now it turns out that um, zombies are more a reflection of our fear of terrorism, um, our fear of infection and outbreaks. So you see a spike in zombie movies about a year or two after we have a SARS outbreak or an Ebola outbreak. Um, so I think zombies stick around for a while because they're so flexible in the metaphor; they change. Um, and so that's, and I think they're going to keep changing as they go, um, just so long as we're always have this latent fear of others. So one final, final question. Um, what is your favorite zombie movie? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I would say I'm a purist. Uh, I still hold very dearly to the original Night of the Living Dead. If I, I know it's, it's, it's kind of the... The, the stereotypical answer that's brought out, but it's actually truly a brilliant movie. There is the exposure to zombies is relatively small. It's well crafted in, in terms of just being about fear. And in a lot of ways, it has uh, a lot of, of, or introduced a lot of ideas that became just standard in the horror movie genre. Um, but it was the first to present it. It also has one of the best twist endings of a zombie movie of all time. So I'm going to go with the original Night of the Living Dead. Well, Timothy Versteinen, thank you very much indeed. Timothy is co-author with Bradley Wojtek of this wonderful, wonderful book entitled Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? A Neuroscientific View of the Zombie Brain, published by Princeton University Press. Timothy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me.